Welcome to the Emerging Minds podcast. Hi everyone, my name is Beck Edser and in this two-part episode we will be hearing from Kimberly, Brad and Beck, who are all parents of children who have experienced different chronic physical health conditions. Beck is a parent of two children who experience different health conditions and Brad is also the director of the National Workforce Centre for Child Mental Health, so it adds an interesting perspective to this podcast. For many children who live with physical health conditions, regular trips to hospital and medical interventions are a fact of life. Unfortunately, these trips and interventions can be quite traumatic for children and their families, and the impacts can stay with them after they are discharged. I would like to acknowledge Kimberly, Brad and Beck's expertise as parents and thank them for taking the time to share their valuable insights into what it is like when your child has a chronic physical condition. Importantly, these insights assisted emerging minds to develop our latest e-learning course, Understanding Child Mental Health and Chronic Physical Conditions. If you are interested in this course or any other Emerging Minds content, please visit us at www.emergingminds.com.au To begin, we will hear parents, Kimberly, Brad and Beck, describing their children and the physical conditions that they experience. So Michaela's a sassy little a little two-year-old. She um, enjoys dressing up. She has a fairy tutu and fairy wings that she puts on and runs around. Um, it's very, very cute. Often it is paired with gumboots. Um, so her fashion sense is still developing. She likes playing with her, her baby dolls. So she, she's quite maternal. Quite often is putting her bubbies to sleep or comforting them. Um, she likes baking and she really loves crafts. So she does lots of drawing and lots of creating. And when she was four weeks of age, she was diagnosed with a congenital heart defect, which is TAPVD, or total anomalous pulmonary venous drainage. And it's basically where the arteries are plumbed into the wrong chambers of her heart. And it means that the clean oxygen that she breathes in mixes with the oxygen that's already been around her body. And it meant that at 11 weeks of age, she required open heart surgery to have it fixed. We've got two kids, so our youngest one, Maddie, is now four, but when she was about four or five months old, she had a initially a seizure that, you know, originally we sort of went, oh, yeah, that's a febrile seizure and they can be quite common in little kids, but hers ended up being a bit more complex and kept happening, and some of them were quite complex as well in that they went for a really long time. So that's sort of what triggered our engagement with a lot of services. So first one, I was actually away interstate, and then the next one I was around for that to happen. So I think with these situations with kids, you always frightened I think by what happens to them and in the moment I think you get into the zone of what you need to do to get help and support but it does over time I think because the nature of it sort of one off I think we're like oh yeah that's just expected I guess in a lot of children that that's what happens but I think because hers kept going and were quite long and severe you know I think why is this happening a bit more seems a bit atypical to what normally would happen with this situation. My eldest who's just turned six has epilepsy which was diagnosed when she was 10 months old And my son, who's almost four, was born with airway issues, which required him to be on oxygen for 12 months and now suffers from fairly severe asthma because of it as well. She was 10 months old at the time, so even now at six doesn't really understand her condition that well. So she was 10 months old having seizures at childcare um, and rushed to hospital from childcare and was diagnosed not long after. And she still has seizures approximately every six months or so because the medication she's on is weight-based. So as she's still growing quite quickly, (laughs) we have to adjust it every so often. And when we do, we have breakthrough seizures. Michaela was diagnosed at four weeks of age, but her um, symptoms started presenting when she was about 48 hours old. So I'd been hospitalised prior to having Michaela. I was a high-risk pregnancy. Um, My first child, so Michaela's brother Thomas, was born eight weeks prem. So I was put on bed rest for six weeks um, in hospital prior to her delivery. In the lead up to her diagnosis, I remember the midwife had taken her out of um, my room to take her into the nursery to do her checks um, and her um, saturation levels had been quite low. 
And um, yeah, they'd taken her up for another scan. And I remember asking the midwife on the way back down. So I went up to meet the midwife from getting the scan. Um, and I asked her how it went. And she said, oh, you need to ask the paediatrician, which to me was a red flag. He was born with tracheobronchial malacia, which is narrowing of the airways. Oxygen helped him for the first 12 months until his airways grew stronger. And now he has fairly severe asthma, which takes two or three different medications to help (laughs) Um, in some way. But he still gets his symptoms when he runs around and plays outside and does everything that a normal four-year-old does. (laughs) So we're often reminding him, no, you need to stop and slow down and (laughs) you can't do this. And then he gets upset, which makes it even worse (laughs) sometimes. Listening to the stories of how these parents first became aware of the conditions that their children were experiencing, it really struck me how distressing this can be for parents and how much there is for a parent to be thinking of, practically to manage their child's physical health, as well as considering how to support their development and well-being through periods where they are unwell. We will now hear Brad, Beck and Kimberly talk about what it can be like for a parent and child experiencing symptoms and undergoing treatment or medical procedures. So she was four or five months old. So I think what we probably noticed is probably energy wise, I think it's quite draining. And, you know, I think as she got a bit older, we noticed some, you know, days after she would be a little bit exhausted developmentally, sort of, you know, she wouldn't be crawling or walking or things like that as well when she was a bit older for a few days. And then I think probably the other bit for us was as I think for all parents is they're still learning to sleep and settle and all those sorts of things. So she was a terrible sleeper at the best of times. <laughs> so that was something we were sort of working on quite a bit that we noticed every time this happened, you'd sort of go back to really disrupted routines. And I think just a disruption to that routine that you started to establish meant that our efforts that can be quite exhausting as well with trying to sort of help her learn to sleep and things like that as well. You know, I think as parents, like we're back to that again. And so that persisted for months and months. So I think we found it really hard just to get to a rhythm or routine sometimes, particularly when they, I think the first probably six to 12 months that sort of happened probably every one to two months. I think probably where the stress does sit more sits in decision making and everyday life sort of stuff. Like if we want to go somewhere, we ask ourselves, or oh, are we in proximity to a paramedic who could, you know, if there's an emergency? So, you know, we wouldn't choose to go earlier days anyway when it was happening more frequently you sort of have to make a decision to go yeah we're not going to go away to this place because might not have the care that we need so I think some of those sorts of decisions but I think you just have to be more vigilant as you would things like supervision being in water all those sorts of things you have to just be conscious of around the nature of it I guess sort of a conscious of what that might mean the experience meant for her as a baby and a toddler and you know I think what we viewed is has to happen and the way we talk about it is you know with health professionals and it can be painful it can be scary but we talk about it as a positive they're there to help and so that sort of is understood and I think that's what helps process it for her so that's probably the big impact but I think for us as parents I think you're probably already exhausted and burnt out (laughs) when you've got little kids anyway and then this is just another layer to that that just added to that stress and anxiety that I think all parents hold but Mm -hmm. just another extra bit to (laughs) keep on top of that. I got a phone call from her daycare one day saying you need to meet us at the hospital. We're taking your daughter there by ambulance. Not exactly the <laughs> nicest phone call to get, but so yeah, that was a very quick hour ringing people to let them know and organise to get people to the hospital for her and all of that. And then walking in, seeing her in a resus bed, <laughs> surrounded by people it was a bit taunting. And then yeah, we had two nights in hospital filled with doctors running in and out and all these different people. So it was quite overwhelming, especially when the doctors changed every day. You never know who was going to come in, even though they're all there for the same reason. <laughs> A couple of visits later, after she had to go in for an MRI, which at 10 months old means putting them under general anaesthetic, because they have to stay still for 45 minutes. And then when we were waiting for her to wake up, the doctor actually called us and said, we need to talk. 
and she'd previously said, we will only need to talk if there's something wrong. So (laughs) automatically we knew something wasn't right. So there was a 15 minutes or so between the phone call and seeing her where we're like, what's going on? (laughs) And then she just bombarded us with all this information and then said, continue with whatever meds she's on because that already put her on medication and everything and then left us (laughs) to go home. Bit of a shock and took time to process and then just having to make do with what we knew until we saw her again, which wasn't going to be till her next appointment in three months' time or so. And it was a lot of looking up stuff at home as well to learn, really, (laughs) because we didn't really know at that stage what services were available to us or anything as well. So it was a lot of self-learning involved. There's just not that much out there to help. (laughs) The paediatrician, I remember, had called the nursery to see whether Marcus was going to be down at the hospital that day. To me, that was a red flag and a warning sign that there was something not right. Um, The paediatrician had been called away by that stage to another hospital, so it was a bit of a waiting game, which was an agonising wait um, because we knew that something wasn't right. And then when he did get back to the hospital, he informed us that they had noticed that Michaela had what they thought was a murmur. So they'd sent her off for a scan and they had checked with a cardiology team and she'd been diagnosed with her heart condition. It was quite terrifying. And I think that being in hospital for so long had been tough anyway, but the diagnosis kind of broke me. Um, And I think the process that followed that all happened quite quickly and was very, very traumatic. So Michaela had surgery at 11 weeks and we uh, had to go over to the the children's hospital in Melbourne. Um, And as a family, we made the decision to drive over there because it meant that we had access to a car. We had a little bit more flexibility with what we could do with our time. Um, Marcus's parents had come down to help us care for Thomas. After surgery, we were discharged and we spent two, I think we spent two nights in Melbourne. We had to do a follow up like a checkup immediately after discharge. And then we came back to Adelaide. Once we were back in Adelaide, we had to catch up with the cardiology team here in Adelaide within 24 hours. And then I can't remember the frequency of visits, but we sort of went every couple of weeks to start with. And then it dropped out to a few months. And now we're fortunately at a phase where we don't have to go for another 12 months. So we've we've had a two year gap and I'm hopeful that that's how it remains. In a way, we're fortunate that her diagnosis was why she was so little because for her, the impact has been minimised. For us as parents, emotionally, it has been exhausting. Um, and obviously it's affected us a lot differently than what it has her. For her she obviously has a very impressive scar or a set of scars and I suppose from our perspective we're reminded of it daily when we're cuddling her you know you can see where she's had the the central line in um, and when we change her or bath her we can see her her scar from her surgery I don't think she's made the connection of, of what that is she is still only two you know she understands so much more than what she can communicate but for a while she hated anything being on her face she didn't like her face being touched um, trying to medicate her now is almost impossible and that becomes a very very stressful event for us so just as an example she's I think she's getting her molars at the moment she complains that her mouth hurts and that her ear hurts and trying to get a dose of paracetamol into her is really 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 stressful um, to the point where more often than not I give up because it's just too hard it's too traumatizing for me and for her and yeah she didn't like things on her face so trying to clean her face or if anyone you know went towards her face she wasn't overly happy with that but that's probably been the extent of it that we can see it will be interesting to see how she goes with future reviews so next year once she's three she'll she'll have another review with the cardiologist and we'll need to go through all the scans again so I think that that'll be a, a different challenge because she's a little bit older It was a big shock and a lot of wondering where we're going to store all this equipment and how are we going to manage this with a two-year-old as well and then thinking, like, is this going to get serious all of a sudden and what are we going to do then? And He had to be on oxygen 24 hours a day, which meant he had a tube in his nose constantly and that's not exactly short (laughs) um so and then we had to every time we went out we had to change to a little portable tank which we had to carry around as well as all the normal baby stuff and then at home we had big oxygen tanks that we had to wheel around the house to every time we had to change rooms and also meant a lot of the time we 
just tried to stay in one section of the house as well, which got a bit boring sometimes. And just trying to adjust to having all this big equipment in the house and trying to work out where we had to store three or four oxygen tanks at a time because being 24-7 at that stage that we went through a lot and they prefer not to come out that often. So we had up to a month's supply of oxygen sitting around our house as well trying to keep a two-year-old away from all this interesting (laughs) stuff (laughs) as well and then you had the same supply of all the portable tanks as well and because then we had yeah trying to remember to order the supplies that we needed as well and try and work out how many we needed because you could only order once a month from the hospital as well so in the start sometimes we ran out earlier and had to beg them to give us more because we didn't know that he would get a cold and needed extra tube changes and everything and as well so the mental overload and physical exhaustion described by Brad, Kimberly and Beck really emphasized to me the significant impacts that families experience from the necessary constant provision of both illness related care and emotional support to their child Parents Beck, Brad and Kimberly all highlight the importance of taking care of their own well-being while they are caring for a child with a chronic physical condition. I'd been in the hospital with him for probably seven days at that stage and that was the longest I'd been away from my daughter as well. But like as a mum, yeah, <laughs> you don't want to leave your son either. So, yeah, sometimes you, they just need to push really especially mothers, (laughs) we all know that they put everything last for themselves. So I think sometimes people just need to push the mothers more and force them (laughs) really to do things for themselves. The nurses in the baby ward, they were really good. Um, And there was some more than others that really actually pushed the self-care of the parents as well. And at one stage, told me to go home, (laughs) like literally shoved me out the door. (laughs) She's like, no, you need time for yourself. And then in the respiratory area, their main nurse was really good as well and she actually um, pointed us in the direction of a few more services that could help and was all over the Centrelink help and like the helpful things. (laughs) But, yeah, then some of the doctors again were think they know it all and are a bit more (laughs) dismissive of everything and try and rush you in and out. We do want to just do all the other things that are important for us as well. So I think that's where it was really important, I think, for kids as well, not to... I think we sort of view in the moment, that's sort of when it happens, but then we go back to life as normal and in that sort of context. And as I said, in the early childhood, that's sort of pretty (laughs) tricky anyway because your routines change and everything changes so quickly anyway. So I think for us, that was sort of probably the hardest part was just the exhaustion that this all creates. As a parent, you feel drained, I think, probably at the best of times, but then these sorts of things just add that emotional layer of stress that I guess sort of takes away the energy you want to have as a parent for quite some time. And I think that was probably the bit we grieve a bit probably more than anything from this whole process is we knew what we wanted to be as parents and when this wasn't happening, that's what we could, but it did just chip away at little bits of energy that sort of over time meant that you burnt out quite a lot more than you normally would be, I think, with this stuff. Um, it's something I think we struggled with a bit and I think I hear from a lot of the parents as well who have children with health challenges or disabilities, just what I call pretty much parental burnout, I think, which is, you know, that idea of parents being burnt out at the best of times, a lot of the time, without necessarily having lots and lots of social networks and supports. You know, I think a lot of parents I speak to sort of say the practical help and things like that as well, that we don't tend to have access to as much today because, you know, our parents are working, all those sorts of things as well. So I think that's something that a lot of parents hold, just that sheer exhaustion, I think, that sometimes is something that would be probably good to label for parents or be, you know, just say you're probably exhausted and and just actually acknowledge that is helpful. And I think particularly in the context of other sort of expectations that are on parents as well, it's just one of those things of it's helpful for people to, I guess, know that that sort of how do we help is to alleviate, I guess, some of that burnout and practical help that 
I think would be often the most useful thing of you know, I think what a lot of parents need you know, help manage the stress. I think a lot of people can sometimes offer emotional support, but not practical support or the other way around. There doesn't seem to be a good balance and it's hard as parents in the middle of it to ask for help from anyone around them as well. Like, I think that's something we don't have a tendency to, you know, go, we just need help. So for some of those natural supports that exist is rather than asking, what can I do to help? Sometimes that's helpful, but <laughs> sometimes it's just helping and doing help. Because when you ask, what can I do to help? You sort of, I don't know, because we just have to manage it on our own anyway. <laughs> like, um, it's sort of hard to label what's helpful. So sometimes it is just finding things that people can do practically that wrap around the family a bit more proactively without necessarily asking. Sometimes it's quite helpful too. I remember um, when we did go into the special care nursery, so we'd been in there for three weeks and by the third week I was done. I'd been so, I was so tired of being in there um, and, you know, having to go home and, try and spend quality time with Thomas and then coming back down to the hospital. And I remember the paediatrician came in one day and he did his, his observations over Michaela. And whenever the paediatrician breezed into the, the special care nursery, he was never in there for a, a huge amount of time. So he'd do a quick check over the babies and then pop back later if there was anything urgent or he'd pop in the next day. But I remember on this particular day, he said, she, she looks okay, still no clearer to the diagnosis, but um, that he was going to pop back in tomorrow. And I don't remember saying anything, but I am going to assume that I gave him a look because he came back and asked how I was going mentally. Um, and it was probably the first time that anyone had asked how I was doing. So I know that the midwives had picked up on how I had been coping previously. In particular, I remember one midwife who, um, she gave me a hug. She said, can I give you a hug? Um, and I burst into tears. And then she said, Kimberly, you're exhausted. You need to go and rest. And she tucked me into my bed. I was still an impatient at the time. Um, she tucked me into bed when I got a hot blanket and wrapped that around me as well and kind of took over as a parent. But I guess, you know, she she recognised that I needed support and she gave it to me. And I think that when the paediatrician asked how I was going, he was aware, obviously, that, that I was a, a little bit wobbly. And I think it's really important that somebody checks on how parents are going because the focus, obviously, is always on the children and the, you know, their condition and their symptoms, but not necessarily on, on asking how the parents are coping or what support the parents need. Beck. Kimberly and Brad have reflected on the exhaustion and burnout they have experienced caring for their children when they have been unwell. When practitioners have recognised the importance of necessary practical and emotional supports for the caregivers of the child, it has obviously made such a difference to these families. In part one of this podcast, we have heard from parents about what it is like when your child has a chronic physical health condition that requires medical intervention or complex treatment and care, and also about the importance of supporting the well-being of a child's caregivers and the impacts on the families. Stay tuned for part two, where Brad, Beck and Kimberly will discuss ways that practitioners can support the well-being of children who live with a chronic physical health condition, as well as further describing family-focused practices. I would like to thank the parents who have so generously shared their time and experiences with us today. You can learn more about supporting children living with chronic physical conditions in Emerging Minds e-learning course, Understanding Child Mental Health and Chronic Physical Conditions at www.emergingminds.com.au. Thank you for joining us. Visit our website at www.emergingminds.com.au to access a range of resources to assist your practice. Brought to you by the National Workforce Centre for Child Mental Health, led by Emerging Minds, the National Workforce Centre for Child Mental Health is funded by the Australian Government Department of Health under the National Support for Child and Youth Mental Health Programme.